the man behind the documentary, the director of Jalen's Fab Five documentary as well, Jason Hare, joins us on this program. Jason, my first question for you is take yourself back to that very moment when you got the phone call and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that we told you we were going to air this later in the summer, but how soon can we get this documentary to the people? It wasn't an, a, a precise moment. We had all been talking about it um, internally. And then people online started to talk about it. And then I, I was texting with Connor Shell, who runs content for all of ESPN. And all of us were kind of gauging whether or not we could get this thing out in time. And we knew that we had episodes one, two, three, and four done. It was just a question of when we could have the final six done in order to, to get the rollout to everybody on time. So, um, but we were, we were still working towards a mid May finish date. We're working as fast as we can. We have been for a while. So that was always the plan was to finish in mid May, but now we could actually start rolling it out sooner. Jason, we appreciate you joining the show. When this pandemic and the social distancing ends, I want to make sure you call your tailor because you're going to be standing on a lot of stages accepting mm -hmm. awards for this amazing. I thought work you were knocking my shirt with this documentary. What was your first interaction like in doing Michael Jordan? Well, the first time meeting him might be a better story. So I'm sitting in this apartment here and it was like 6.30 and, and I was going to run out to the gym and I get a call from Estee Portnoy, who is Michael's manager. And she said, hey, um, and I had been talking to her for a year about this project because they were trying to get it off the ground and, and find distributors and a bunch of people who make more money than me were deciding how they were going to roll this thing out and who was going to be partners. So she said, can you make it up to Midtown in a half hour? Um, Michael wants to have a drink. So I changed out of my clothes, rushed up there, and I was thinking the whole way up, like, what do you order? What's the first drink you order with Michael Jordan? Like, do you order? <laughs> like, so um, I told my brothers that night, it's like meeting Santa Claus. Like, you've heard of this person before. You've seen them in pictures, but it doesn't, like, they're not a real person. That's not a real thing. That's a statue. That's like if the Statue of Liberty, like, bent down and shook your hand. <laughs> there he is. And he, you know him. He's got that charisma, and he immediately makes you feel welcome and relaxed. It wasn't until like 15 or 20 minutes in and we were talking. I said to him, why do you want to do this? And he said, I don't. <laughs> and I said, why not? And he said, because of all the misperceptions out there and there's a lot of footage in this thing that's really raw and he didn't want people to take it out of context. And we talked about how, you know, giving people context from the horse's mouth is actually the way to go to explain why you are the way you are. But then we started talking about, I said that there's a lot of misperceptions and somehow the Hall of Fame speech came up. I, I said, you know, like the Hall of Fame speech. I don't think people understood that. And he leaned forward. It was like it was in a movie because we're in this dark lounge and he leans forward and this light comes over his face and the glint of the light came off of his hoop earring. <laughs> he me like this. And he said, who's the only person who understood what I was talking about? And he pointed his finger and his finger goes out like this for like a foot and a half. And, it, <laughs> and that's the first moment I was like, holy shit, that's my <laughs> Like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, but immediately he was like that. The only person who understood that was Pat Riley. And I was trying to compliment people. And from the from the from the very get go, he was all in on um, on answering any question that I had. So um, and from there it was it wasn't until over a year from then that we actually did our first interview on camera. Wow. I mean, I have a very important follow up question that you did not answer. What drink did you order when you sat down at the lounge with Michael Jeffrey Jordan? Jameson on the rock. <laughs> he, did, he did seem to be sipping something brown during the interview, and there are some there was. problems, a little bit of a continuity and problem. The ice was melted. Yeah, where you see something going down a little bit, it goes up a little bit. How many refills did we have during that interview? I had nothing to do with craft services that day. I focused on the interview. Good answer. Well, and he had some unique cigars too, you know, long boy types. <laughs> he, um, 
he was taking a lot of heat about that off camera. Ahmad was 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 off camera, came to the shoot that day because they just came from the golf course to that first interview. And Ahmad was like, you going to give him a real cigar or is he going to use that for the whole time? So correct. if you see Michael looking over his shoulder and kind of like smirking, it's at Ahmad. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm just I'm still reeling after watching just the very first episode of this 10 episode film. It, I'm just really it really teleported me back to that era with the music and the footage and the clothes. And one thing I was really curious about the decisions that you made was around not, the world. Nah, yeah, yeah. The whole chronology because obviously we're focused on that 97 98 season and after the first four minutes they've already won five titles and you're like, wow <laughs> this really is going to focus in on that one season and then we jump back to unc after they took the trick to france and you continue to sort of like use this back and forth style which is very well graphically represented how did you sort of attack this as not just the story of one season but the story of a team the story of his life and how you would present that to the audience chronolo chronologically well the the chronological spine of the whole series had to be 97 98 because that was the driving force behind why we were doing this is that they had this tre treasure trove of footage that no one had ever seen before it sat you know in a basement somewhere at the nba for 20 years so that was why we were doing this in the first place but with 10 hours there's only so much you can say about one season or one person so we knew we weren't going to spend 10 hours on just that it was going to be the story of the dynasty through the lens of that season um, those first four minutes or the first six minutes, I think it is that you referenced most of the world, they'll be seeing this on ESPN. They'll be seeing it on Netflix outside the U S and under a certain age demographic. They know who Michael Jordan is, of course, but they don't know the details of that team. They may not know that they right. won five titles before. So we had to give a quick primer to a new audience to say who these guys were, why they were so important and how famous they were back then but also the guys like you, Jacoby, who know that story. We had to scratch a little nostalgic itch, maybe play a little Biggie, a little Puffy, do something that keeps the people who know the story uh, entertained as well. So that was a, the, episode one is a really tricky one to pull off because a lot of it people will be like, I know this, I know this. So the, the challenge was keep it interesting enough that it's entertaining to people who are experts, but also educate the people who don't know and keep them entertained as well. And also, he killed in college, made a big time shot in a championship game, played with James Worthy, future Hall of Famer that was a number one pick. Sam Perkins, big smooth, went number five, played for Dean Smith. And then he got to the league. And I appreciate the road trip when they were in the hotel and he went up and the teammates allowed him to come in and he said he saw a lot of drugs that he'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that seemed to be a turning point as it related to how he wanted to be a leader so very young in his NBA career. He said, you know, that I had to lead. I couldn't lead with my voice because I had no voice at that point. He was he was the third pick in the draft. No one at that point knew that he was going to become Michael Jordan. Everybody knew that he was maybe the most electric player in that draft. And he was a college player the year before, but no one knew what he was going to become. So he didn't have enough clout to sit to to. It wasn't so much leadership by certainly by vocal leadership. It was saying, I'm going to have nothing to do with this. And at that point, he didn't even drink alcohol. So he would literally hang out in his apartment um, all day long, watch movies. He had a pool table. He had a Pac-Man machine that he would invite people over to play. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, nothing, none of that. It was all basketball all the time. He was a gym rat. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.